to this conversation on uh, CBRS 3.5 spectrum sharing um, in the U.S. and, above, and uh, beyond. Um, this conversation is part of a report by Sense of Healing collaboration with RCR Wireless. And uh, uh, today uh, I'm talking to um, uh, Ia Karaz, is the CEO of Federated Wireless. Uh, Ia, thanks for being with us today. Uh, thank you, Monica. Um, okay, so... Um, 3.5 CBRS in the U.S. It's a it's a new uh, it's a very new innovative experiment uh, um, in in the U.S. for uh, sharing spectrum and using spectrum more efficiently. Uh, but before we get into that, can you tell us a little bit about uh, uh, what is that you do at uh, Federated Wireless uh, um, and how did you get started in the first place? Sure, I joined Federated Wireless. Uh about three years ago, and before that, the scientists that had started the company have been working on creating the technology and pushing the regulation for shared spectrum there. We've been dedicated to the space for quite some time. So you, you started before CBRS, uh, uh, the CBRS acronym even existed? Yeah, absolutely. Um, that uh, process itself for shared spectrum, the thinking about it started a while ago. The whole idea was how do we stop clearing uh, these bands of spectrum before we can auction them so we can make more spectrum available and not have to move people around? And so the scientists, science started a long time ago. And the scientists that started the company have been working on it for a little more than five years now. So which other bands were you working on before? Uh, primarily now 3.5 is what we're working on. So before that, we were working on specifically just the, the general science of it, cognitive radio, how a tiering system might work, what are the different ways that you can real-time share information and, and be able to chop up spectrum on a real-time basis. So the general concepts of, of the technology is where this thing started. And so what is special about 3.5 CBRS in the US? Because as I said, there, there has been some, some work on spectrum sharing before that. What, what's special about 3.5 uh, uh, and CBRS in the US? Yeah, the, what's new about it is what's called the three-tier model, which really comes back to this much more tighter reuse, um, the ability to go out there, go to this band that's fairly massive, 150 megahertz, that is lightly used by the government, uh, by various agencies and other commercial incumbents, and then come up with this scheme that allows a combination of what a general access looked like, uh, an organized form of unlicensed Wi-Fi type access, plus the ability to create a new licensing scheme. So there's actually quite a bit of innovation in it, but ultimately what this is about is a much more tighter reuse, tighter packing of spectrum to create opportunity that wasn't there before. And that's very important because spectrum is, is obviously limited. There's a hard limit of how much spectrum we have. So the more efficient we are, the the better off everybody is. Um, now, what is your role of federated wireless in this old, this, it's a new ecosystem because it, in addition to whoever transmits and there's many of different, more sure. people transmitting on the same band, um, there are, uh, what is your role, specific role of federated wireless in this old ecosystem? Sure, federated wireless is building software and hardware to enable access to the spectrum in the new way. So our basically uh, deliverables are two things. Number one, a way to protect the incumbents in the spectrum to allow the majority of the spectrum to be accessible. And number two, be able to automate as much as we can about the FCC process within the regulations as, as much as the RF performance, RF engineering steps in order to make the spectrum available for anyone. So ultimately what we provide is software and hardware tools to make that work. And how does it work in terms of how, how did, where do you fit in, in, the, in the general ecosystem in doing that? Yeah, so in the old days or before shared spectrum, um, spectrum is a very static commodity where a carrier would go get some spectrum through an auction and then they would ask equipment makers to build to that specific spectrum under an RFP process and so on. So in this shared spectrum model, there's now a new uh, element, if you would, there are new software in the network that allows this dynamic sharing of spectrum that people can uh, get access to it to be able to get access to spectrum on as need to basis. So that extends 
all the way from the creation of the ecosystem itself and all the standards. And we've been instrumental in creating and pushing for a couple of different open standards bodies. One is the Wind Forum Shared Spectrum Committee, which we still co-chair uh, with the Google team. And the other one is uh, help create a CBRS alliance to help with the commercialization uh, of the shared spectrum, specifically for LTE with a whole bunch of big names like uh, Qualcomm, Intel, Google, Ericsson, Nokia, and Ruckus, and so on. Um, but in this new world of shared spectrum, a lot of the standards, a lot of the policies and regulations are left to the industry to work on and to work on as a group and to do it in an open forum. Um, and then once that's done in either one of these two forums, then equipment makers can build equipment once and it's usable by anybody in the system. And therefore what we're doing right now is helping across all three lines. We help with all of the underlying uh, support for the regulatory bodies and the standards bodies to figure out how to actually make shared spectrum work. We're building the actual systems that would manage the spectrum, so-called uh, spectrum access system and ESC uh, in order to make the spectrum accessible. But we're also helping also with the commercialization of the spectrum. For example, we're helping in the CBRS Alliance create uh, places where you can commercially test uh, interoperability of any CBRS equipment with other pieces of equipment and be able to simplify that model. So ultimately what we present commercially in the marketplace is a, uh, is a spectrum controller product uh, where someone can subscribe, get access to spectrum, and they only pay for the amount they use when they need it. Uh, but behind the scenes, we're doing all the work to make it work from regulatory on one end standards, as well as building the software and hardware to be able to make this commercially viable. Yeah, and so it, it sounds like the, so there is a re regulatory framework from the FCC to enable all of this, but at the same time, the success of CBRS is tied to the fact that uh, all the ecosystem players are playing together from, all the way from the vendors to the, the service providers and the um, enablers like uh, you are. Um, so it, it sounds like the process is proceeding smoothly because there is a lot of sort of competing inter interest. There is the legacy users, the military, the wireless ISPs, all the way to anybody that wants to use the spectrum that is registered. H how do you feel it's going in terms of the, the process uh, behind it? Yeah, no, it's gone quite well, actually. Um, ultimately, Spectrum, the best thing to, to think about when you think of Spectrum is that it's either highly used, highly concentrated, everybody wants it, or it's a Spectrum that really nobody has used and it's barely used. There's sort of no middle of the road for Spectrum because once you make it viable from an ecosystem and once you start seeing economies of scale from chipsets and from devices and equipment and so on, everybody would want to use that spectrum. It's a lot cheaper if you can get access to it. Uh, so in this case, what we did is we started the process, like I said, almost three years ago, working first with the incumbents. Uh, as a matter of fact, our founders started even before that, working with the incumbents to understand what are the special needs of the users from the DOD that use the spectrum, and how do we build protect their privacy and build protect their security and so on. And then we've uh, formalized that discussions back in, along with the Google team you know, two and a half years ago when we started building the shared spectrum committee within the wind forum, invited uh, the government entities that had interest in it. Plus we started making sure that we have enough representation from the commercial sector. And, and now we're a little more than 80 entities or so in the wind forum and a very significant number of them are actually part of the shared spectrum committee and have contributed quite a bit. And that includes carriers, uh, representation of cable companies, equipment makers, chipset makers, and so on. So the, the first piece of success for us was to have this quasi-government commercial entities getting together to work through things in an open forum where everybody's comfortable with the endorsement of the FCC and NTIA and others that this is a good forum to do the work. As we started evolving a little bit more, about seven, eight months ago, we started figuring out how to create a commercialization engine around this, meaning that it's just not enough that the spectrum is available, we know how to chop it up and, and share it, but also how do we make sure that we can build LTE systems on it? How do we understand interoperabilities with things like multiplier and 3GPP and the small cell deployment schemes and so on? So we, we relied heavily on partners like Qualcomm and Intel and Google, and like I said, Ericsson, Nokia, and Ruckus to begin that process. And, and now we've 
uh, have this CBRS Alliance launched and, and it has more than 40 members and continues to grow. So our thinking from day one was you build the product at the same time you build the ecosystem because the ecosystem is actually where the product comes from. And then alongside all of that, we've worked to make sure that we educate regulators on what's needed. We look for changes in policies if needed, like power limits or, or ways that you actually create licenses in here, work through any type of conflicts between, conflicts between different members and find ways to mediate that, uh, come up with technology solutions along the way. So we've had uh, a beta product of assess now for over a year. We have 30 trials signed, a good portion of them have already gone through. We have more than 15 OEMs integrated. We're down now to 24 hours to integrate an OEM into a SAS, maybe two days now. Um, uh, we announced ahead of Mobile World Congress uh, integration and collaboration agreements with both Ericsson and Nokia, along with uh, other partners we've announced in the past like Ruckus and others. And we continue to build the ecosystem. So what we've done is we've decided that uh, along the way from day one that you work on regulatory, you work on standards bodies, you work on open platforms, you work on product development all at the same time in order to let this system develop um, in the most natural way for the maximum number of users uh, to find good and neutral and open places where they have access to how this works. They understand that uh, this, these platforms are open, they allow for competition, but also be able to come in and present their needs so nobody's left behind, that there's an equality here for all of us to have to share and all of us to have needs that can be met. Absolutely, and uh, that, that's very impressive. And it's actually good to see that everything's moving pretty quickly uh, on this front. And uh, um, you're tasked with a, with a very, you know, challenging task. You want to be obviously reliable, uh, but you also want to be fair in making sure that the dynamic spectrum allocation is uh, uh, works uh, to everybody's satisfaction to be as obvious as possible. Um, how does your spectrum controller do that? Um, the spectrum controller ultimately uh, is a cognitive engine that is a real-time performance manager of the network. It calculates multiple propagation models in multiple directions. It has a lot of machine learning techniques to get feedbacks from the network. And it's also got uh, specially built sensors now that we're beginning to deploy that would feedback information to it. It's all built into the cloud, so it's massively scalable and it allows for a very uh, well-defined and automatable set of APIs so that you can get real-time analytics on what the spectrum is doing and what the environment around you, and you'll be able to feedback based on that, you know, the rules that you want and how to automate it. So for example, if you're building a point-to-point -point system and you wanna know that if the spectrum environment and the quality of the spectrum adjacent to you is at a certain threshold, then you'd like to be able to add that to your equipment a, you can get that data real time anytime you want it, and B, you can automate that process of adding more spectrum, as an example. There's also additional APIs that we're building to integrate with existing OSS and BSS systems, integrate with SDN and NFV, um, allow for a lot more data access for people that want to do analytics. So ultimately, the way we're, we've done it is we've implemented through these standards bodies that we've been working through now for years all of the different policies and procedures and standards that come up with. We continue to sponsor more discussions and more strategy discussions around fairness, around sharing, around algorithms of how to allow coexistence of different technologies and so on. And as these standards and technologies and rules are get finalized, we implement them in the system in a real-time software basis. And we make them exposable through these well-known APIs. So what happens if you have a situation where you have uh, basically more demand than you have resources? So there are more, more uh, entities that want to use the spectrum and those entities might be using the spectrum in different ways. It might be indoors, outdoors, point to point, point to multi-point, uh, mobile access. Sure. How, do you, how do you pick, how do you decide? What is the time scale uh, uh, in terms of the dynamic allocation? Sure, um, there ultimately are four steps along the way of how you share spectrum and how you maximize the value for everyone. The first step is really through uh, planning algorithms and propagation models to make sure you're taking advantage of the maximum amount of data and the maximum amount of knowledge to be able to protect these systems 
but at the same time not overly protect them to the point that you're wasting spectrum. And so that's the first line is to be able to optimize. And that's what sets shared spectrum separately from things like Wi-Fi where it's completely unmanaged is that having you know, the one controller or the centralized systems that look at this at the entire stream, then you're able to maximize the use for everyone. But then that's still not enough eventually, even though the expectation it will be about 10 times more efficient than a, a, a licensed spectrum. You know, if you put that in consideration where Wi-Fi is 30 times more uh, geographically packed, 10X is probably the right target to go after. As you go from there and you fill that up, then you get to the next step to say, you know, what do I need to do next? Um, and we've come up with what we call um, spectrum management or fairness algorithms that look at proportionality of, of demand and, and deployment and how to allocate spectrum for multiple users in, in locations where they're, they're both oversubscribing based on their deployment needs. These are algorithms now and models that are, we're defining in the CBRS Alliance with, as a group and we'll be implementing them. And then once you apply that, you still have no sort of a third tool after that, which is the priority licenses where uh, roughly half the spectrum can be, is going to be set aside for auctioning at a later uh, part of this process, perhaps 18 or 19, where you can apply for the ability to have priority over someone else because you own the license for 10 megahertz or 20 megahertz. And so that would be sort of the third line where we would apply these priority license rules when they become available. And when all else fail after that, and you've done all of that you could, and you, then obviously we expect that as the system gets packed and gets used and the efficiency is there and people see the, the proof points, then we hope to be able to get additional ranges of shared spectrum that we can add to this model. Because as we prove out that we're able to allocate it efficiently and improve the utilization of this resource, then obviously more resource can be made available. But that's sort of the way to think about it. Yes, and uh, well, that, that's, that's very interesting. Now, another dimension is uh, the other SaaS. So uh, you obviously need to work with the um, uh, service and uh, the network operators, uh, but also you need to interface with the other SaaS. How does that work? Um, every SaaS will eventually have a copy of the entire network. That's the way they built. We've defined the SaaS to SaaS interactions and communications as part of the Win Forum process. And uh, we have demonstrated with the, really the only SaaS that has code right now, which is the Google SaaS. We've demonstrated federated wireless in Google, the interoperability and the exercise of these algorithms and, and protocols back in December and uh, we put a press release out. Uh, but ultimately uh, the way it works is the SaaS will share information and where they think they might be uh, operating in the same geography and allows them both to manage interference margins and manage an intelligence allocation for their users. And in essence, for their users, they act as if they're one SaaS in that environment by interacting uh, cloud to cloud source. Well, that, that's very interesting because you need to have a much tighter integration of all the different moving parts of the different ecosystem players. And uh, uh, so that's, uh, that's all very, very exciting. Um, now, in terms of, let's talk a little bit about the business models that CBRS uh, uh, will hopefully enable. Um, so we're trying, to, we're striving for innovation here. Uh, what does it mean in terms of business model? What, what is it, what do you think is going to change? Sure, there are many, many business models emerging. As a matter of fact, we've seen about 10 or 12 business models so far in this process. Um, the, the clear ones, the ones that are very obvious is small cell densifications for carriers and operators, indoor deployment as network extensions for operators. Um, and then you go up from there. I think we've seen people look at this to create a new managed service model, sort of called the so-called neutral host, uh, where um, instead of uh, in the current process where you use DAS equipment that are quite expensive and, and limiting in terms of number of locations you can go to, people are replacing that with uh, in their models with 3.5 uh, small cells that are shared really in the end of the day, not just spectrum, but you share the radio, you share the infrastructure, and you can create the managed service model where multiple users can use it. Uh, that's a new model that we expect that will probably begin to gather some steam um, because it's usable not just for operators, but it's usable for enterprise customers. Uh, when I was at Mobile World Congress, we've seen a lot of interest in the so-called private LTE, 
uh, for enterprise customers, uh, specifically from industrials and logistics types companies. There's tremendous amount of interest in that. And there's a lot of work now on creating ways that you can extend where Wi-Fi is and, and full and how do you actually add this as a, as a private LTE model. On top of that, we demonstrated back in October at Dell World with Ruckus and Qualcomm and Dell, you know, what is a private LTE looks like side by side with what a Wi-Fi system looked like. Uh, you've seen a lot of announcements about trials of private LTE. We've seen requests from logistics companies to see how to use it. We've seen uh, convention owners or uh, sports facility owners that are looking to create private LTE networks in order to offload their Wi-Fi networks for things like internal traffic and security and so on, but also to add new applications, including things like VR and bring pumping content to every seat so that people can enjoy the, the activity that, that they're there to attend even more. Um, so that's a third model that is also, um, I had anticipated that it will start later, but it's actually uh, it's getting a lot more uh, momentum behind it. Uh, there is also uh, new entrants that potentially could come in, whether they're cable companies or other people that aspire to be operators, where this system allows them to get to Wi-Fi economics at the end of the day, or enterprise Wi-Fi economics, but you're able to get a shared LTE model and you don't have the, the very, very steep spectrum costs and other costs that can come into the picture. And there's other, other adjacent models that people look at, for example, We've seen people look at trials now for point-to-point -point or last mile replacement that uh, they can do uh, so-called uh, 5G type applications, although they're done on sort of gigabit LTE and to see how you can get a maybe backhaul replacement, especially as you deploy small cells. We've seen people look at um, how to take this and use it for, you know, home hubs, security cameras, IoT type applications, connecting to thermostats and and even provide some sort of meshing between the different boxes in a home application. And we've seen people also look at this to take it into sort of consumer IoT applications, wearables and so on. Although I think that that's a, a much harder application to, to work on given the nature of the spectrum. Um, we've also had the traditional WISP business, uh, the last mile uh, wireless cable modem product. Um, that's obviously as a big beneficiary of this because they already operate in the space and they get now more spectrum, more access. And uh, you know, some of the big players like Google have announced that they would like to use some sort of model for wireless backhaul to extend their fiber networks. And so there's been a lot of interest in that as well, sort of a, a wisp on steroid, if you would. Um, so there is a large number of applications people looking at, a large number of interested users from different spaces. Um, and that's really what makes the ecosystem quite exciting is that the scale that everybody would get out of a shared ecosystem is obviously massive. Yeah, well, so that, that's, and that's very interesting because not only you share the spectrum, it's different business models and different users that uh, are uh, hosted in, by the same band. So that, that's, uh, that's even more exciting. Um, now in terms of timing, you mentioned a lot of trials, a lot of, there's a lot of activity, but when can we expect to see commercial uh, deployments in the 2.5 band in the US? Yeah, so for my radio equipment, chipsets and so on, most of the development is already underway, if not the products are out there. Um, I would expect that, you know, final form factor of the chipsets will be later this year, maybe fourth quarter into the first quarter next year. Uh, the certification of SaaS systems like ours should start uh, getting finalized sometime in the second half 17. And that's frankly when we expect that we will be in a position to achieve certification, assuming all the activities we need are covered. Uh, there are deployment needs for ESCs, which we are starting our deployment process. We expect to have a significant portion of the continental US covered uh, right around the third quarter into fourth quarter this year. So I expect commercial launch uh, for these types of systems to be in the second half 17, and then beginning deployment into 18 and beginning to launch some service into 18 and then obviously extending into 19. Mm -hmm. Okay, now uh, 
to, to close up, let's, let's talk a little bit about uh, what, what, what does it all mean uh, beyond the U.S. in terms of spectrum sharing and how is spectrum sharing going to evolve from here? Because this is, in a way, it's, a, it's a first, one of the first steps like white spaces and uh, CBRS. And what should we expect uh, in the future? So beyond U.S. and in the future, what's, what's going to happen? Yeah, well, we, we obviously hope that this will be a global system beyond the U.S. because as we prove out the efficiency of the spectrum use and the speed by which we can make spectrum available, obviously that is a competitive advantage and every, every uh, regulator will look at that and say, well, I certainly don't want to be prohibited from doing that and I, I want to pass this on to my own domestic industry. But uh, the, the global environment shapes up in multiple ways here. 3.5 itself, or this band itself, is looked at very heavily for 5G. Overseas now in multiple locations. So that's actually creating uh, support for the ecosystem itself from a chipsets and, and equipment and standards that's beyond just sharing. For the sharing model itself, there are several different regulators internationally that are beginning to look at it. But that process is still a little bit early. Um, and they'll wait for the US to prove out the model and go from there. And then I think, frankly, most people are now trying to figure out how to stitch a global system around this because people like the industrials and, and logistics companies and, and companies that have private LTE needs, they really would like to see a global system. So uh, we are working on ways to figure out how to start a global system earlier than shared spectrum being available everywhere. But in general, everything will depend on uh, us continuing our progress, showing the benefit, showing the proof points in the US and then we hope that the model will continue to extend beyond that. Okay, yeah, well, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts with us today. Um, and uh, this was part of a, a conversation, the conversation which is part of a, a report by Sense of in collaboration with RCA Wireless on uh, uh, spectrum sharing, CBRS 3.5. Um, yeah, thanks so much for being with us today. Thank you, Monica. And thank you all for uh, listening in.